Welcome to the Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey everybody, welcome to the Drum Shuffle. Jamie Eads joining you as always. This is episode 60. I hope everybody's having a fantastic week out there. We have a great show coming up for you today. Before we get to that, I do uh, want to give my condolences to the family of the great Hal Blaine. We learned just a couple of days ago that Hal had passed at the age of 90. And if you have listened to any hit music from the 60s, 70s, or early 80s, it was most likely Hal Blaine's drumming that you were listening to. Uh, I think he had over 40 number one hits that he played on. Just a legend in the drumming community. So my heartfelt condolences go out to Hal's family and to all of us in the drumming community. Uh, We have a fantastic interview and episode for you today. We are going to be joined by uh, a man that has just had a legendary career in the music business, uh, and he's just one of the kindest drummers that you'll ever run across. We will be joined by the great Jack Bruno right after this message from our sponsor, Los Cabo Strumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabo Strumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center or heart of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned Red Hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of Red Hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, everybody, we are going to be joined by someone who has a resume that I think any musician would kill for. Uh, the great Jack Bruno uh, has played uh, with Tina Turner, Joe Cocker, Peter Frampton. And he is out on the road as we speak with the great Delbert McClinton. Uh, Jack has just done so much fantastic work over the years as a drummer. So I was really excited to be able to connect with him uh, on the phone for this interview. And he, he just gives so much great knowledge uh, in this conversation. Uh, I can't thank him enough for being so open and honest when we spoke just a couple of weeks ago. So without further ado, please help me welcome the great Jack Bruno to the drum shuffle. Good evening, Jack. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fine, thanks. How about you? I cannot complain a bit. Hey, thank you so much for taking some time to come on the drum shuffle. We really do appreciate it. No, thanks for asking. I'm uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, Jack, what we like to do is kind of go back in time Tell our listeners um, where you grew up and and how you got behind a drum set to begin with. Well, um, I, I grew up in uh, in Belmont, Massachusetts, which is a, a little burb just outside of Boston, about ten twelve miles. Uh, and um, let's see, there, there were several musicians in my family, and they played uh, professionally. There, 
a bunch of working musicians. Uh, and um, so I was always around a lot of music. And then uh, my cousin, one of my older cousins, played drums. And uh, I started taking lessons from him when I was uh, oh, eight or nine, somewhere in there. So that that's how it got going. I got you. So, so you grew up with it, essentially. Yeah, lots of music around, lots of players. Well, being that close to Boston, you know, I have to ask the question, and I don't know the answer, but, you know, you're right there in the shadow of the great Berkeley College of Music. Um, you know, did, did that play any role in your life? <clears throat> no, uh, it did not. But, um, you know, when you're talking about Boston, when you're talking about Boston in the 60s, and it's a huge college, university town, and uh, there were uh, a lot of uh, great venues around, and there was a lot of, uh, of people uh, playing and traveling through town. Coffee houses were really popular, a lot of smaller venues. There was a circuit in the Northeast, a bunch of coffee houses. So um, not to mention just the amazing number of musicians just in town uh, uh, working, playing. Um, but um, the coffee houses for me were uh, an education. You know, what I'm talking about, you know, when I was about 14 years old, uh, playing in bands and then uh, hanging out in these coffee houses and, you know, guys would come through, bands would come through for a week and, uh, you know, I was getting turned on to just uh, hearing a lot of great stuff. Um, uh, you know, people who are just getting getting going and playing in smaller venues, you know. Uh, but I was hearing a lot of blues. Uh, I was hearing uh, people like uh, uh, Muddy Waters and the Butterfield Blues Band. And uh, 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 I was hearing a lot of uh, uh, folky stuff. Richie Havens was around. And, uh, and um, God, who else was playing around then? God, the names are... Uh, are not coming quick enough, but um, it was an incredible education just to hear all these people coming through. The, the Jefferson Airplane were playing in small clubs at that point in time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, I was just getting exposed to all kinds of stuff uh, at, at a young age in Boston. So uh, it, it, the Berkeley didn't uh, come into play for me, nor, nor did it ever. Uh, I, I, I never really, uh, had a formal education plan. So, uh, more, more had, to, I had some basic, uh, lessons when I was a kid from my cousin. And then, uh, I just started playing in bands when I was about 12 and just kind of, uh, learned as I went. Yeah, so, for sure. Well, I mean, it's a it, very similar story to my own, you know, it, it, sands the you know getting to see jefferson airplane in clubs <laughs> you know well yeah and and yeah and others i mean just so many i, I uh it was just uh incredible you know to hear some of these people you know absolutely so, and at a really young age just getting exposed to a wide variety of music it was pretty cool absolutely now you said you know we started forming your own bands at a at a young age did you did you follow that all the way through into adulthood? I mean, obviously you make a living as a drummer, you know, talk us through, you know, kind of your transition from a young guy in the Northeast playing in the club circuit to kind of that first big break. Well, yeah, I, I'd been playing in bands just like uh, anybody else, you know, any other young person, you know, in school playing it, whatever, <clears throat> Churches, dances, uh, you know, junior high, high school, um, and then um, moved on to uh, got into a band with a bunch of older guys um, when I was about uh, let's see, I was fourteen, fifteen years old. Uh, these were like college age guys, older older guys to me. Yeah, you know, they're like twenty. <laughs> so <laughs> old guys, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, we. Uh, one summer, um, we went to uh, we went to New York to uh, try and get a a manager and a record deal, and uh, and we got both, and uh, and um, recorded a couple of albums for Atlantic, and I think we probably you know sold a total of uh, 
you know, 50 or so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Similar story, right? It went plywood on day one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, but, but it was, it was a great experience and, uh, you know, uh, learned a lot through it all, traveled a bunch, you know, in a van and, uh, you know, got stranded here and there and, um, it was, it was great. Uh, and then I just, after that all kind of fell apart, uh, just ended up, uh, bouncing around in, in, um, various little bands in the, in the Northeast, uh, from, uh, Rhode Island, Providence to, uh, to Boston, to, uh, upstate New York and, uh, you know, and had odd jobs and, you know, played in bars on weekends and went through that whole thing. And then, um, finally, uh, I had a few friends who were living out in Los Angeles, a few players, some guys I'd been in and played with, uh, you know, in Boston area. And, uh, and they, that was around 1976 or so quite a while back. And they said, come on out here, you know, uh, if you want to play. So, uh, I, you know, I, I went out, uh, I wasn't looking to be in a band. I wasn't looking to be a studio guy. Uh, I was just looking to play drums and, and make a living. So, uh, that's, that was a big transition for me. Um, mo- moving out of the Northeast and, and heading towards LA and, uh, you know, being more of a, uh, uh, drummer for hire, so to speak. Um, I was just taking anything that uh, came my way, uh, whatever was put in front of me. So uh, that that was a uh, that was the big transition in my life, as far as that stuff goes. And did you say uh, something about uh, getting a gig out there? I can't remember the rest of your question, but yeah, I mean, I, I always like hearing from from guys and girls that you know have done as many amazing gigs as you is kind of that first big break but obviously moving you know completely across the country and and you mentioned the year 76 and you know that was a time in the la scene where things were were it was a little bit of everything you know there was a lot of stuff going on it was great it was a great time uh, to be out there so i have to say that I might have been better a little earlier on when all that stuff was going on with the Eagles and Joni Mitchell and the Crosby, Stills and Nash and, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, that whole scene earlier in the 70s. But um, it was a great time. There was a lot of music happening in L.A. It was, there was quite a bit of work around. So it was good. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think at that time, you know, it was the – you know, punk had really, you know, started happening on the West Coast. It wasn't just Absolutely. an East Coast thing anymore. You had, you know, kind of the, the new wave skinny tie guys were starting to happen at that time. It was all happening. Yeah, in the early 80s, that's that was rocking in Los Angeles. You know, I, I played a bunch of those gigs with people, different people, different singers. I was kind of being a hired guy playing with different bands. So, yeah, that was that was very much happening. Yeah, all so... So you're getting your name around L.A. Tell us about kind of, you know, the 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 first big break where you knew something was happening. Well, <clears throat> you know, I had been just playing with a lot of different people, doing a lot of different stuff, just a lot of different venues, just doing anything, really. Uh, so met a lot of people and, uh, uh, um, you know, some people liked what I did. Not everybody does or, or you know or will but um uh the you know there were sort of little uh, I, I always felt positive about what was going on there because I, I was running into some good players uh you know playing with some really good people um i was getting some calls to do stuff and you know i was feeling really positive about it but uh but and i had some decent you know money gigs it was it was okay um, but my best, uh, the, at that point in time, the biggest break I got was, uh, to do, uh, an audition for T and Turner. It was sort of the, the biggest name, um, you know, uh, I had gotten a call for, but I had done some shows with, uh, with other people in town, you know, where we were the house band for, you know, people like Chuck Berry and, and they would do like doo-wop shows and there'd be, you know, there were some other name people, but, uh, but 
just sort of a house band scene. But when I got a call for the Tina audition, that was kind of the first big, bigger, uh, you know, singer artist that, uh, you know, I got a call from. And at that point in time, she really was kind of <clears throat> not, uh, she kind of faded from the, uh, from, uh, you know, she wasn't, uh, she wasn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, as she was trying to come, come back from her whole, uh, situation with the whole breakup with Ike and all that stuff. So she really was, uh, you know, she wasn't big. She wasn't doing a whole heck of a lot. She was, uh, she was playing in hotel ballrooms and stuff like that. But anyway, that, that was my first big sort of name call was for that gig. Um, and, uh, they never called me back. They were, they, they <laughs> called me to do an audition. I never heard back from them. typical LA. I said, okay. At the time. I called them back and, uh, I can't remember. It was like two or three weeks later. I said, well, what's happening? What happened? He said, well, we found somebody. Sorry. So, uh, and, and at the same time, at the end of the conversation, the guy, I think he was the tour manager at the time said, do you know any guitar player? So, Gave him a couple of names of guys I'd been working with, and one of them got the gig. <clears throat> a friend of mine, who I'm still friends with, and uh, I don't know. A couple of months later, if that, I get a call. Uh, same guys, you know, Tina's tour manager. Uh, Tina's not happy. With the drummer they hired. Do you want to come up and play? So uh, that was the actual real audition, and then that went down. So. That's fantastic. So your guitar playing buddy returned the favor. It sounds like it always works like that. Yeah. Doesn't it? I mean, it's always your friends or somebody you worked with. There's, you know, yeah, absolutely, yeah, so, yeah, for sure. Well, and you mentioned in there that you know at the time Tina wasn't you know the international you know superstar that that she became just a a, a few short years later. It was pre the movie it was pre all of that stuff and she was just working you know we yeah. were just working the audition was at the fairmount hotel in san francisco they were doing you know two shows a night six nights a week you know i ended up getting the gig and then that's what we did we, we'd go to cities for two weeks at a time uh you know park in a hotel ballroom and and uh do two like one hour shows every night six nights a week had a great time it was it was the steadiest work that i had you know so it was it was my best gig by far at that point in time so uh it was great i had a blast learned a lot yeah and then all of a sudden she releases you know probably the the third biggest selling album of the 80s <laughs> Yeah, it got really large. What, what was funny is um, I didn't see it coming, um, and I quit um, after I can't remember. I think I started doing that about 1981, and um, I think it was a, somewhere around 1983-ish that I I just thought to myself, you know, I'm I'm tired of this. It's not going anywhere. I think I'm uh, I think I'm out. I'm gonna go back to L.A. and you know take my chances see what else I can dig up. And uh, shortly after that, <laughs> <laughs> this huge single came out. And uh, it's like, wow, that was a, that was a bad call. But unfortunately, <laughs> I, I got a call back. Uh, uh, you know, Tina liked me. So actually, I got a call to do a video because I was living in L.A. And the drummer they had was from, uh, was from London. And uh, so they just needed somebody to do the video, and I did the video. I think it was for her second single, and then they asked me if I wanted to come back, which I was, of course. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to ask me twice, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <It's> no brainer. <laughs> you know, I'm good. I'm oh, in. Well, so during this time, you played in front of quite possibly some of the largest audiences ever gathered to see live musical production, right? Well, there were the, you know, the usual, um, arenas, you know, sizes, size places. And there was, after a while, uh, there were, you know, uh, the stadium gigs that came later, the stadium stuff, but arena size places. So anywhere from, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15,000, you know, arenas size venues. And then there was, uh, one, uh, one point we went down to, uh, 
The biggest one I can remember was a, a stadium called Maracanã Stadium in uh, in uh, Brazil, huge soccer stadium. I think that was a like some sort of a record-breaking crowd, like 180,000 people um, uh, for that show for Tina. So that was exceptionally huge. But, yeah. um, the other stuff was outside of, you know, like there'd be like these huge festivals in Germany, uh, weekend festivals, which they don't do much of anymore, but they'd last for a few days. There'd be, you know, a couple hundred thousand people. They're like Woodstocks, you know, throughout the summer. Uh, so those types of things were really huge. So, yeah, yeah. it's just uh, amazing. You know, I mean, it, it, to, to have those kind of gigs and to, you know, to, to play with an icon like Tina. And then that wasn't enough for Jack Bruno. <laughs> you played with another just absolute legend in the business. At some point you started playing with Joe Cocker. Tell me about that. Well, um, uh, once again, um, uh, there were, uh, a couple of people I had worked with, with Tina, uh, a sax player and a guitar player, who had done a tour with us in 1987 and 88 had been playing with Joe. And, uh, when, uh, and this was around 1992 when this went down, cause we had done a tour again in 1990 with Tina, but, um, they, um, Something went down with the drummer that was working with Joe, and those two guys uh, recommended me. Also, uh, another thing that was happened in my favor was Joe's manager uh, and Tina's manager were one and the same. Oh, Roger okay. Davies. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that helped, but but mostly it was the it was the band two band guys that I'd worked with already. So that's how I I went and uh, I played for Joe and. Uh, he liked it. it was good. So uh, that was a great thing to to walk into. So yeah, I mean, I I can't even imagine. I mean, if, if, did you have any nerves walking into that gig? I mean, it's Joe Cocker. Well, you know, honestly, I'm trying. To, I'm sure I did. I, mean, I can't really recall exactly. Um, you know, there's, yeah, I'm always going to have some kind of nervy thing, especially on the first gig, but, um, um, you know, what, what made it comfortable for me was the fact that I was with some pals I'd been working with, you know, so, and, uh, um, you know, so I was, I started out comfortable, so, it, uh, and feeling good about it. So, you know, uh, I think that kind of, uh, you know, transmitted to Joe somehow with those guys being comfortable with me in it. And, uh, you know, he liked it. It all worked out in my favor. I just kind of walked into it. I was just really lucky that, that you know, I knew some guys who were working with him. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, those, those are two just, huge icons in the business that that you've worked with and you know i mean I, i'm sure being able to put that on your resume ensures that you're gonna work until you don't want to i mean it's hard to say you know people uh who aren't in the music biz say that to me um because i'm like because i'm just like any musician i'm just, and i still think it's like this could all stop at any time you know you just never know when this is going to be over you know work just dries up whatever and and people say oh no you have uh you know credentials and you've played with so-and-so it's like, but you know what it doesn't really matter i don't think when it comes to musicians and people who are going to hire you uh I, you know, it just really matters if the chemistry is right, if you're, you're right for the gig, if you're, you know, how you're playing and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I don't, I guess it helps to a certain extent if you have a couple of names you can throw out there, but I'm not so sure. You, you know, know, I, yeah, I, th I think that's a fair point. You know, I just, I guess where my brain immediately goes to is if, if all things being equal, 
there is drummer X who doesn't have the resume and Jack Bruno who does, <laughs> you know, I mean, I feel well, it like it all depends on what you, what they're looking for. You know, if drummer, if drummer X has, uh, has, uh, you know, specific skills that somebody's looking for, you know, namely way more chops than I got, uh, then, you know, it's not going to matter who I played for. Um, so, you know, cause I, I just do a sort of a specific thing. I'm just, I'm a, just kind of a groove pocket guy. So, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, it, it won't, wouldn't matter if, uh, <laughs> who you, who I played for, if I didn't have what, uh, <clears throat> they were looking for, you know, in a drummer. So, yeah, that's fair. Well, speaking of grooves and pockets, um, you know, we, we typically don't, you know, go into the, the blood and guts of, you know, what somebody played on what album. But I, I will say this, you know, your, your gig that you're playing, I guess, most frequently now with with Delbert McClinton, um, you know, I, Delbert, first of all, is just uh, just awesome. You know, I mean, just an awesome musician. But the, I love Delbert. Oh, I, I love playing with that guy. Just he's, so he's been awesome. One of my all-time favorites for a long time. Yeah, I love what he does. But what <laughs> what you bring to that band is exactly that. You know, Delbert is known for you know that you know foot stomping, booty shaking kind of music. You know, and <clears throat> yeah. and you're bringing that. You know, so. Talk to us a little bit about how you and Delbert got hooked up and, and, you know, that gig. Uh, well, I played for Delbert. Uh, I've been playing for Delbert this time around for probably close to four years now, but I had worked with him a little bit back in 1998 or nine for a short while. Um, once again, I knew a couple of guys in the band, uh, uh specifically a, uh, uh, you know, now that I think about it, and I'm thinking out loud, uh, I had worked with a couple of his Texas buddies when I was in L.A., <clears throat> a guy named Glenn Clark and another guy named Stephen Bruton. Both uh, Stephen has since passed away, uh, cancer victim, but both uh, brilliant uh, songwriters and, and great guys. And uh, Glenn Clark specifically, uh, uh, they had worked together, him and Delbert had worked together for a lot, a lot of years. But uh, I think that may have been a bit of a connection uh, for me, uh, connecting with Delbert. Um, but I also knew uh, a couple of guys in the band here or in town. Uh, so that uh, I just went over and played with Delbert. That's how I, you know, and and ended up, uh, you know, it was sort of an audition. We played through a bunch of tunes, and um, it was uh, it was a blast. I had a great time, and uh, so I worked with him for a while, and then ended up going back out on a tour with Tina. So I, I left, but, um, but this time around, um, you know, I came home from, I think, geez, Cocker, Joe Cocker had passed away at the end of 2013. So I was back in Nashville without, without a gig. I was just kind of not doing much, uh, for a little while. And then, uh, got a call to sub some gigs for, uh, for Delbert. And, uh, we all had an absolute blast and little by little, I was just subbing more gigs and subbing more gigs. And then, uh, I, uh, they just asked me if I wanted to do it on a regular basis. So I said, absolutely. I love his stuff. I love those grooves. And, uh, it's just, a, it's a diverse bunch of material. You know, he, he touches on a lot of stuff, not just sort of the, there's some blues, but uh, more than anything, it's just just a lot of rootsy music, you know. There's a, there, and there's a lot of stuff that Delbert famously fused together, you know, kind of genre, genres of music, you know, that uh, you know, uh, rock and roll and country and just uh, just this this that trashy uh, Texas R&B stuff that he does, which is my favorite stuff to play, but. Um, Anyway, uh, that's how I got reinvolved with, uh, with Delbert. And, uh, I don't know. I just, uh, the, the, as far as the groups go with Delbert, uh, I mean, I, I really, uh, I feel that stuff. It's my favorite stuff to play, but, uh, the chemistry in the band is what really matters too. So, um, we play well together. So, uh, and, and it feels good as a whole. 
So, um, because we, we just, it, uh, we just work, um, we feel the bad, we just feel the same stuff, you know, in the band. So, uh, I think that's why it feels so good. You know? Absolutely. It, it, it's not just me, you know, it's a bunch of guys and we're all in the same, you know, wavelength. So <clears throat> it works out. Yeah. You guys are doing a ton of good work out there. And, and, you know, I, I, I can't remember where I read it, but somebody had to ask Delbert in an interview at some point, you know, when are you going to retire? And he, 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 he basically said, you know, when they throw the last shovel full of dirt, (laughs) you know, know, it's not like he knows what else to do or wants to do anything else, you know, or, or can do anything else, which goes for all of us, probably, you know, most of us like, well, we don't really want to do anything but play. You know, well, that's where we're happy. So. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I mean, I I think of all my musician buddies that, you know, that, that do this for a living and, and I probably wouldn't want them to prepare my taxes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> you know, I, I probably wouldn't want them to cook my dinner either, you know? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. You might not want them in your house. So. <laughs> it, 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 it does take a certain skill set to move beyond the music industry, I think. But, um, you know, you've, You've done some some other great gigs. I mean, it, it's obviously beyond the scope of of our time here to talk about everybody that you've played with. But you know, one that's near and dear to my heart. You did a lot of good work with Peter Frampton as well. I did a tour with Peter, um, uh, and we opened for uh, Journey. It was a summer tour, and that was the whole gig. So I uh, got to play with Bob Mayo and John Reagan. And, uh, Peter and myself is just a four piece. So that was real different for me. Uh, uh to be honest, I, I wasn't real familiar with Peter's stuff. I mean, outside of the pop stuff that you, uh, you know, everybody was familiar with Frampton Comes Alive, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, uh, I can't say that I was a huge fan of those tunes, but, um, playing them and then playing some of the, uh, the uh, the more the rockier humble pie type stuff that he uh, used to do was was a blast and uh, you know I I don't think I was Peter's favorite guy at the end of the day but uh, I, I definitely uh, you know uh, I learned a lot on that gig too you know, so um, uh, it was uh, it was fun to play and uh, and uh, you know uh, Frampton is a uh, what an amazing guitar player. I had no idea. You know, I always thought of him as the, the you, you know, uh, Frampton Comes Alive guy. But uh, man, he rocks hard. He's, he's, he's great. Yeah. I, I mean, and he's not just a one-trick pony. You know, a, a lot of people, just they just know Frampton Comes Alive and, and the that Humble Pie stuff. That was all I knew. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, that was all I knew. So, but... Uh, He's quite a great guitar player. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that only lasted. That was a short one for me. That lasted one summer. That was good. Yeah, well, I mean, if if that's, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a guy that makes his living as a drummer, a summer tour is sometimes all you need to get to that next thing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely. They it all, yeah, it all, it all works. To, it all goes hand in hand, you know, and you're out there and you're playing with different people and being with different people. And, and yeah, it all it all moves forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, now you, you've been making your home in Nashville for a while now. Are you doing quite a bit of session work as well or are you primarily I, focusing on the tours? I, I do what, you know, uh, it, at this point, I'm just playing with Delbert more than anything, and I do some session work, but I'm certainly no first call guy. Uh, I do some stuff. I do some CDs, you know, some low budget stuff, and you know, it's typical Nashville things where you, you know you go in and do six tunes in three hours, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> or you know, you cut half an album in one day and then the other half the second day, and uh, but rootsy stuff, you know. Is the stuff that people will call me to do. Um, I certainly don't play in any big pop country records or anything like that, but you know, I'm happy to do any of it. So, 
Yeah, for um, sure. No, to answer your question, no, I don't do a lot of sessions, but um, I'll I do whatever comes my way, which is what I've always done. So, <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, you're keeping as busy as you want, I would assume. Um, you know. I, and here's what's cool about Nashville. You know, I spend some time down there and, you know, everybody just immediately thinks of Nashville as like this country music hub. And certainly it is. But I think people would be really surprised to know how many rock and roll guys, especially classic rock and roll guys, make Nashville their home base now. Well, yeah, I think there's quite a few people that moved here, but also the guys who, a lot of guys who are playing on these country records are, are rockers. Hey, right. You know, they just happen to be good players. They're, they're just, you know, they're doing these sessions, but not necessarily just country guys. You know, they're, especially the new pop country stuff, which is basically rock, you know, so, um, yeah, there's, there's great players here. I mean, the talent pool is deep, you know. They're all over the place, and uh, there's a lot of different stuff going on. Yeah, well, the running joke, uh, you know, on this show is kind of, you know, when you go to Nashville and you're sitting at, you know, Applebee's or whatever, and the guy brings you your burger and beer, you know, chances are he's the best guitarist in town, you know. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. and there's a few that are working at Home Depot, too, so, uh, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The talent pool is... uh, extensive and just so many great players you know sadly there's just not enough work for all of them yeah for all of us yeah i mean for sure well and you know i hate to jump around so much but you know i'll rewind a little bit back to you know when you got to la tell us about some of the people you were rubbing elbows with you know in the late 70s early 80s in la because i know you've got stories well I mean, in the late 70s and early 80s, I was just playing with, I was doing auditions for bands. Uh, there was there was a lot going on. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot more solo acts, uh, you know, solo pop acts, singers uh, looking for, you know, that would have side guys. Um, it, it wasn't so all uh, band oriented stuff. Um, but um as far as um, I mean, I, I was rubbing elbows with some great players who who were working around town, um, but uh, I mean, I don't know about any you know name name people outside of you know some great musicians that I've gotten a chance to play with, but um, who were just working around LA as well. So um, I don't know if I really. Get, was rubbing elbows with anybody famous at that point in time or, um, so, uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I've just heard so many stories, you know, it was before my time, obviously, but, you know, I've heard stories of, you know, when you went to, I, I don't know, you know, the, the whiskey and there's, you know, some cover band in there playing, you know, that, you know, the guitarist ended up being in, you know, this huge band in the eighties and, you know, the, the bass player ended up in another huge band in the late eighties or early nineties. It was just, you know, I, I guess my point in all this is Nashville today is kind of the melting pot that LA was at that time. Right. And there were lots of guys and girls around at that point who ended up like me, fortunately, you know, getting great gigs with, with, you know, famous people. And then some of them I'm uh, still in contact with. And a couple of them are actually here as well in Nashville. So, uh, you know, guys who ended up with Rod Stewart or Richard Marks or, uh, you know, Don Henley or, you know, ended up getting good gigs, you know. So, uh, yeah, there was just more work around, you know. So, uh, the, uh, well, I, I was, over the course of your career, I mean, I, I would like to explore that if you're willing to, but, you know, you said there was more work around. And, you know, I think that brings up a really good point. Tell us, you know, a little bit about what you've seen change in the music business over the course of your career. 
Well, from a, from a working player standpoint, I think there were not that I was ever a, a big session guy, but there certainly are a whole lot less sessions around, um, and that's been happening for a long time. And a lot of guys in in LA who would never go on the road, you know, because they had this killer session career going on, ended up, you know, doing gigs, um, you know, traveling around because the sessions. Just, uh, there were fewer and fewer of them. Uh, but uh, also what changed is um, there were more uh, sort of solo singers around who, who hired side guys. I think the industry got more, <clears throat> as it progressed, got more band-oriented, um, um, you know, and is now, it seems, more band-oriented. There's sort of less work for hired side guys, you know, the kind of stuff that we did. So those were the most sort of notable changes for me. <clears throat> you know, the, the session guys had going out on the road and, and uh, more uh, band oriented acts as opposed to singers like Tina or Joe or, or, you know, people who would hire bands uh, to, to, you know, back up a, a solo singer, you know, pop singer. <clears throat> well, you know, with the, the the Grammy Awards were just televised here recently, so so I'm kind of. <laughs> I didn't watch. Well, I you know I I didn't either. I mean, I mean, I'm just going to be perfectly honest. But you know, um, one of my friends said, you know, it took about two and a half hours to see an actual honest to god instrument being played on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, that's a huge difference now too. You know, I mean, as as drummers, <laughs> you know, we're we're being replaced. And I know they said all this stuff in the '80s too with the Lynn drum machine and. And all that, well, but it's well, that's easier what was now. Happening. Yeah, that's what was happening when there were fewer and fewer sessions. That was part of the reason for sure, you know, uh, you know, machines and still the case. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, definitely less work around because of that. But uh, uh, I, I read something uh, the other day about uh, uh, a producer, uh, I think I think it was Ross Hogarth. He said he thinks there should be an award on the Grammys for uh, guys who, before they even start mixing a session, have to tune vocals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, sometimes and have to spend a day tuning vocals <laughs> and and getting the timing, the phrasing right on vocals before they can even start to mix the record. Like, Come on, damn. Well, you know, sometimes the truth hurts, and you know, I mean, I. I'm a proud member of the Recording Academy, and you know I, that's one of the accomplishments of my life is being a member. But mm -hmm. you know, when I see that, you know, for example, on the telecast, they don't even televise best rock album. I mean, right. what planet are we on that the best I, rock album award can't even make the telecast? I I don't know. It's become so visual to the whole the music biz, you know. Not my favorite form, you know. The whole video thing, MTV thing, just kind of it it, it it just uh, just detracted from you know just listening to music, you know. It just became such a visual thing, you know. I kind of wrecked it in my mind, so you know. Well, and you know, here's the other thing, and I'm certainly, maybe I'm part of the problem with a show like this, but you know, back when I was a kid and idolized all these fantastic musicians, there was mystique around them. You know what I mean? It's like you, you didn't know when they were going into the studio, you, you, you know, and now I can you know, get on one of these social media apps, Instagram or something, and tell you what Steve Gadd had for lunch on a session, you know, last way, week. Way too much information, you know. It's just too much information all the time, 24-7, you know. Yeah. Overload. And I, I mean, and I think it takes away some of that, you know, danger that rock and roll music had 20, 30 years ago. I, I agree. I agree. Good point. Yeah. You know, so I, I just think that the mystique of the industry is kind of gone. And 
you know, I don't want to be the old guy that's saying, you know, you kids get off my lawn. That's not what I'm trying to get across. But there is no mystery surrounding anybody anymore. There is no anonymity in in our society. True. It's true. You know, so, um, you know, but you're one of the guys. uh, And when we kind of did our pre-call, you said, you know, I haven't done a lot of interviews o- over the years. And, you know, which I think is really cool that we ended up getting you on the show, you know, because your story is one that deserves to be told because you have literally worked with, you know, just some of the iconic artists over the years. Um, tell me if you if you can tell me some of the things that you've learned over your career. Um, well, I, I've learned how to be, uh, well, I try to be more of a, of a, well, certainly learned how to be part of the machine. You know, you want to be part of the band. I learned how to be more of a, of a team player. And I, I love being just part of the band, uh, and playing my part. Um, and, uh, I certainly learned how to stay out of the way. Of uh, of uh, vocalists, lead singers, you know, uh, you know, but uh, my simple uh, style lends itself to to doing that anyway. But uh, and, and in a, a non musical sense, um, I've, I've certainly learned how to uh, be flexible and uh, get along with. Uh, you know, a whole lot of different personalities, uh, especially when you're traveling around in a bus and living with people every day. So, uh, you know, uh, I've learned uh, by having to learn uh, material uh, for different people, you know, different styles of stuff. So, you know, I've learned I've learned how to play <clears throat> some uh, different kinds of songs that I might never have played. So, uh <clears throat> Uh, I can't think of what else at this point. Well, I mean, I I think it's just, um, you know, it goes without saying that anybody that can have the longevity, you know, certainly says a lot about their playing. It also says a whole lot about their personality, you know, and, and that point is not lost on me. And we talk about that a lot on this show. It's not the the 90 minutes you spend on stage, it's the other 22 and a half hours in the bus. Yeah, absolutely. You got to, you have to, the chemistry uh, has to be, you know, everybody's got to get along. So or otherwise it's not going to work. So yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I, I was just thinking another thing I learned that was really important was just traveling around Europe. I, I learned where to get uh, my laundry done in most <laughs> major cities. <laughs> <laughs> and where to get really good Italian food almost anywhere. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, you know, that's something that a lot of people don't think about. You know, if you go out on a six month tour and you've only got room for two weeks worth of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. You, you got to know where the, where the fluff and fold laundries are that, if they exist. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. You know, and a, a lot of my <laughs> touring buddies that they say, you know, if you're ever in, you know, Topeka, I know where the the best cup of coffee is. I know where, <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> you know, you, just the things you learn doing all the traveling. So, um, Jack, I want to be respectful of your time, and we we really appreciate you coming on. But one of our traditions here on on the Drum Shuffle is we always ask our guests for a good piece of advice, and you know, you you've been at this for so long, and I'm such a huge fan fan of your playing it just goes without saying i would be honored if you would share a good piece of advice for our listeners well well um i think we, we may have already touched on that a little bit but um i i, I think that if you're going to be a hired guy uh you know a side guy for anybody or uh i think you have to remember that uh it, it, it's not your band um you know, uh, you're there to to uh, to play a part. Um, I think you need to keep that in mind. So, um, you know, it, it, if you want uh, if you want to do something else, you, you know, you need to start your own band. So you have to be respectful of the whoever it is that you're 
playing for or with. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think you just need to be open to, uh, to people, uh, suggesting, uh, maybe parts to play and not be offended in any way. If somebody says, a person you're working for says, Hey, can you play this here, play that there? Or it's like, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's why you're there. You get paid to, to play for a, uh, a person. So, and, uh, and, uh, you know, it's also extremely important to be, uh, flexible and uh, get along with the people you're traveling with if in fact you are out on the road um, uh, and even if you're in the studio I mean that's the, the whole the vibe of the whole thing uh, the, of the band and is is what makes it uh, is a big part of it you know everybody uh, you know collectively uh, creates this uh, this good energy amongst themselves and they're, they're playing off of each other. They're having a good time and it reflects in the music. You know, you're up on stage and, uh, it, it, it makes it all happen. So you, you know, don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> very well stated, Jack. That was the, uh, yeah. And it, but it's very true. And, it kind of yeah. Be flexible. Keep it simple. I mean, you know, just uh, you know, keep an open mind. Take some direction. Uh, you know, it's 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 all good, as they say. Absolutely. Well, and and it begs the question, you know, and, and forgive me if I get this part of it wrong, but I think I read a, an interview that you did with Modern Drummer. Uh, you know, I, I've been a subscriber to Modern Drummer since I was 12, I think, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, it's been a long time, but I read an interview and, and you said that um, Joe Cocker, the, the way that he would correct something in your playing is he would kind of come up to you after the show and say, what was that weird groove you were playing, you know, <laughs> or whatever. He, yeah, he never, yeah. he never said, Jack, don't do that. He would say, what was that weird thing you were doing? You know, yeah, and, John was fairly easy with that uh, stuff. I mean, uh, Tina was very selective. I don't want to say selective, but you know, there was staging, there was dancing, there was stuff going on there that, that she needed drum parts for in certain places. <clears throat> Joe was more of a rock and roll guy. <clears throat> but and you could I could play I had quite a bit of freedom I mean I could do what I wanted to do um, uh, for the most part there were certain tunes that you know needed the specific parts there especially little help that big sort of bombastic thing at the end but um, but yeah I remember one time in, in particular uh, that I did mention in the article was I it was the end of the shuffle tune that we used to play Crabby River okay and uh, I went into this flat tire groove at the end of Crimea River and went off the shuffle, well, went off the shuffle that it was and started playing that uh, stumble shuffle flat tire groove. And, it, it, I, um, and you're probably familiar with it. I'm, I can't think of a song that it exists in, but um, sure. are you familiar with the, with that particular I, groove, the I, flat tire? Thing? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, so I started doing that at the end of the tune, and that just kind of threw him for a loop, and, he, he, and that's what I got at the end of the show. <laughs> what was that? What was that you were playing at, Jack, at the end of the like, That was a flat tire groove, Joe. Well, he didn't say don't do that, but he was just, I didn't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Message received just, just, loud and clear. Yes, I did, it was received. And, and the one thing I learned about Joe uh, was that he was a very quiet guy, and he didn't say a lot. Um, but if he did speak up, he was... He had been thinking about it for a while, so pay attention. Yeah. Um, so when he did say something, it was like, okay, I got it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's a fantastic story. I just remember, you know, I happen to remember reading that, and, you know, I, I wanted to at least mention it before we let you get out of here. But, um, I, Jack, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. My pleasure. I uh, enjoyed the conversation. You're taxing my memory there, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's not every day that we get somebody on the show, you know, that, that has played with so many just iconic figures. And it I'm, I'm a lucky man. That's all I know. 
we'll be looking forward to it, guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just being able to to pay the bills as a drummer is lucky exactly. enough. You know, I mean, that's that's exactly. luck in and of itself. But some of your gigs, man, I you know, I would uh, I would trade places with you in a heartbeat. If you ever want to do that, let me know. <laughs> You don't want to hear me do a radio show. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, if if uh, if you ever get the flu and Delbert's looking for somebody, you've got you've got my number. So, <laughs> Del- yeah, Delbert's a blast. You'd love that. <laughs> so, well, Jack, again, thank you so much. You're welcome here yeah. anytime. Um, everybody, go see Delbert McClinton with the great Jack Bruno on drums. Jack, thank you, well, brother. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. And uh, come out, we get we get up to Kentucky. Come on out, let me know. You know I will. You know I will. So, all right, man. All right, thanks, Jack. Sure. All Take right. care. All right, guys and girls, that's going to wrap up episode sixty of the Drum Shuffle. As always, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We really, really appreciate it, and we simply cannot do this without every single one of you doing so each and every week. So please hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using to tune in. We have some fantastic guests coming up over the next few weeks that I promise you will not want to miss. I will be joined next week by the great Dan Aaron. Uh, Dan is uh, headquartered out of New York City, and he is just absolutely demolishing the world of jazz with his excellent playing. You are not going to want to miss that interview. So hit that subscribe button and this will pop up in your podcast listening feed automatically. As always, we love hearing from each and every one of you throughout the week. We love getting your emails and we do respond to each and every one of those. The Drum Shuffle Podcast at gmail.com is where to drop us a line. Our web address is thedrumshuffle.com. And you can find more information about me over at jamieeds.com. While you're there, hit all of those social media links. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, We do try to have social media posts throughout the week, and we would love to have you as a follower on those platforms as well. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers.